Well, hello everyone. It is Friday, July the 26th, 2024. I am Dale Delbridge, Benchmark Realty, Murfreesboro, Tennessee. This is your status chat. Now the PCE came out today hotter than expected and we're going to go look to see what the pundits think and then we're going to do a little diving ourselves. So hold on, here we go. If you like this content, please go to calldelltosell.com, find the tab that says on YouTube, click it, and it'll open up a page of QR codes. There you can use a smartphone to scan and get to the YouTube page, or you can just mouse over and click it on a PC. There you'll be able to subscribe to this little button over here and click the notification bell so that YouTube will notify you when each Friday's blog has been uploaded. Thank you. All right, well, what I have here is just a simple Google. You see the ever-changing. Every day they get a new one, but it's, I'm looking for PCE News today because what I want to see is the headline. I want to see what the headlines think. And we're looking at the top story. CNBC, a usual suspect, says Fed key inflation gauge rose 2.5 in June from a year ago, easing path to rate cut. We're going to look at how they're looking at this. We're going to assume some things. Today, inflation from Barron's. Today's inflation data leaves September rate cut in play. Seven hours ago, nine hours ago, two hours ago, Wall Street Journal, Paywall Street Journal, PCE inflation gauge slips 2.5 in June. All right, now that one they're using the slippage remark, and, and they're probably pointing to a direction we're going to talk about two hours ago, five hours ago, Reuters, cooling U.S. inflation bolsters September rate cut hopes. Key Fed, Investors Business Daily, IBD, key Fed inflation rate stalls, but September pivot is on track. All right. So what are we seeing just from that little snippet? A variety of personal interpretations. Some are spinning it to the positive seems like most of them are spinning it to the positive, even though they are looking at the increase from the PCE. The PCE actually came in higher than expected. Wasn't much, but it's still going in the wrong direction. So if we're looking for a rate cut, remember why we have the rate cuts. We have the rate cuts when we have an economy stalling, when we're heading into recession. So. That's why we're trying to do it, because we're slowing something down. We're trying to get the people to quit spending money, and we need to go to, from quantitative tightening to quantitative easing so that people spend more money. That's completely different than if people are tapped out and maxed out on credit. So let's go look at the PCE itself instead of looking at the news reports. This, of course, is from the BEA Bureau of economic analysis. I believe that's what that stands for, unless they've changed that since the last time I remembered. Personal consumption expenditure price index. Now remember, this one is the one that Chairman Powell likes to use because it is weighted differently than the CPI. CPI puts more weight on housing and renters equivalent than the PCE does. But let's go ahead and look at this and see what they say. And here's something that I want to notice right off the bat. We were at 2.7, 2.7, 2.6, 2.5. So from that standpoint, why it certainly does look like inflation is getting under control because it is in fact decreasing, right? We just saw that screen. Let's bring it back again. It's going down each of the months. So that's why I think one reason people are thinking, hey, inflation is getting under control. Chairman Powell said he wanted to see inflation get under control before he cut rates. But let's do a little bit of a deep dive in this and see what they're talking about happening. So here we are, home news, personal income outlays, June 2024 news release. We've got that personal income and outlays, what we just said, 2024. There's the publication if you want to reference it, but you can just Google it. It comes right up as the current one. Personal income increased. Let me highlight this. 50.4 billion, that's two tenths of a percent at a monthly rate in June, according to estimates released today by the U.S. Bureau of Economic Analysis, tables two and three. Disposable personal income, personal income, less personal current taxes increased. That means wages have got to be going up $37.7 billion or two tenths of a percent. And personal consumption expenditures, PCE, increased $57.6 billion at 0.3%. So I want you to notice right off the bat, the PCE 
increased at a higher percentage than the DPI or disposable personal income. So that still tells me that we're losing ground. Now we can look at the various months. You, I'll leave that for you because I want to get down here to the summaries down here. This is an important paragraph. The 57.6 billion increase in current dollar PCE in June reflected an increase of 53.1 billion in spending for services, an increase of 4.5 billion in spending for goods, table two. What did it just say? It's saying that the PCE actually outpaced disposable personal income and we're just seeing the first line of the report say that most of the growth was in services, not goods. So the price of goods is beginning to steady out, maybe even tip a little bit where it may, it's not yet gone into deflation, but it's not growing like services. So let me ask you this. Services then are mostly labor and wages to a degree, right? We have kind of labor and wages, and then we have things. So if it's not things, it must be the others. So if it's the others, we're seeing a massive increase in services, and yet the wages aren't keeping up. Now, some of the services can be like cloud services and rental services and things of this nature, but we are certainly looking at the difference. I want to draw attention to the difference between services and goods and which one is expanding, which one is not. So the next line says, within services, the largest contributor to the increases were other services led by international travel. So people are still enjoying their vacation, laissez la bon temps roulé and housing and utilities that would utilities are going to get into energies remember because they always like to separate food and energies when the core looks good they'll talk about the core but when the core looks crappy they'll talk about the total led of course by housing within the goods largest contributors to the increases were other non-durable goods led by pharmaceuticals and other medical products because we've been seeing health care skyrocket expenditures in the labor when we look at the beige report we've been seeing where the jobs and the jolts and the whatever as they come in we're seeing that government and healthcare are the two big industries that are giving the new jobs up so let's go back to it now personal outlays the sum of the pce personal interest payments and personal current transfer payments increased 50 9.3 billion in June. Well, isn't that more than the increase in the current dollar PCE? More of it's going. So what does that tell you if we're doing interest payments, current transfer payments is higher than the PCE is measuring? Personal savings was 703 billion, which isn't a whole lot for 360 some odd or however many million people we have. So we see that is only 3.4%. So 3.4% to me, I don't think is a heck of a lot of cushion that anybody should be comfortable with. I would like to see something bigger than that. Now, prices from the preceding month, PCE price index for June increased one tenth of a percent. That's not much. I like that sound of that. Prices for good decreased two tenths of a percent and prices for services increased by two tenths of a percent. All right. So there we see, we see a beginning of goods, the things dropping in their increase, they're actually decreasing at a rate while the services are continuing to escalate. So what is that going to do for our overall economy when it comes to people who are in manufacturing? Maybe not everybody's in government or health care. So we got to be start looking honestly at that. Now, the real PCE, I'm going to skip this paragraph right here. The real PCE, the two tenths of a percent increase in real PCE in June reflected an increase of two tenths of a percent in spending on goods, even though goods are decreasing, and an increase of two tenths of a percent in spending on services. Sounds a little bit like some double talk when we turn it and we try to convert it to the real measure versus the index measure. We can look at that. But now, now I think we've dwelt long enough on suffering hearing me read because I always try to deliver the news quickly and sometimes I get a little over exuberant and get a little tongue tied. So I have something else I want to bring into you because we saw the headlines 
from the very first tab, which was Google, just a simple Google search. The market thinks it's great that we're heading to a lower cost of money. They're gambling on this based upon what they think Chairman Powell and the other banks, uh, people in the committee are going to do. And they're just saying, haven't we suffered enough? We're bound to be getting our pre-election decrease that we expect. And what do we expect if we get one at all? It'll only be a quarter of a percent or 25 basis points. So it's not going to be earth shattering if we get it or if we don't get it. But I think what they really want to see is a pivot from QT to QE to see. And that's going to take a crashing, a little bit of a crashing economy, a little bit of worse jobs numbers. So if I'm listening to my chairman of my Fed, I'm going to think if he looks at the economic data, we're not going to see a change in rates in September. If I'm looking at the politics of it, and I hate to do this, it's really people ticks, it's how it affects people's lives. We looked at an attempted murder of an of a ex-president. We look at some really slow developing news that comes out of it. We're seeing that the president has been outed as not actually be running anything. If that was a surprise to people, I, I don't mean to be political, but now we've got someone else in, which is only marginally less dislike than what we had. And we still have our very real economic challenges, irregardless. I put that in there for English majors, irregardless of what your political orientations or leaning is. We, we still have a mess. Doesn't matter who, when they take the White House, blue or red won't make much difference. We still have an untenable debt. I could, I should pull up the tab where Chairman Powell has pointed out this is unsustainable. This spending that we're on is unsustainable. It helps the rich that can leverage inflation and the poor fall further behind. It, it just the numbers may go up, which affects what taxes they pay, but their actual standard of living doesn't increase. So let's look at this screen that I have for us right here. The gross domestic product. And here we have the advanced Q2 came out. I think it was either today or maybe it was yesterday, 25th. Yeah, it was just yesterday. And look what it says we're doing with the GDP. The GDP has doubled since the first quarter. So to me, that looks like we are accelerating our economy. Yes, we can say that the inflation is trending down just a tidbit. But our economy is still strong and going. And I think it's going to really get back into before Chairman Powell changes his mind, if the politics can be set aside. He says he's not political, but let's set the politics aside and say, what do the numbers tell us? The numbers kind of tell us that our economy is still going great guns. People, those who want to work are working and they're working harder than ever before. We've seen a shift from full time to multiple part times and they still count as jobs in the overall report. So we have to look at that. But let's go back to this screen and look at this. This doubled. I don't hear a lot of people talking about the decrease in inflation, even though it may be decreasing month to month of this calendar year, year over year, it was it's it's down, but it but it's still higher than they expected. They expected it to go down even further and it didn't. And we're looking at where the rates are coming in from. They're coming in from services, which we would think will have a tie in to labor. And if it ties in to labor, we can only expect that that's going to lead to more wages, which may help the people out. But it's not really going. It's not really going to help them if we if the people can't outpace the inflation, if we're still falling behind, it's 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 kind of dragging it out a little bit. But on the macro, it looks pretty good to the micro, to the individuals who are trying to feed their family. I went shopping before the show today and before BB, before Biden, I was buying pork butts for years for 99 cents a pound. Very stable price, 99 cents a pound. Ramen noodles have more than doubled. Most food items that I buy have more than doubled. Today, I looked at a pork butt because I was going to do another barbecue for the week and it was three dollars a pound just shy of three dollars a pound so that's 300 percent increase in that i don't know about you but google can show me all the good news i want but i know inflation is higher than what they're telling us it is so let's look at one other tab here let's see how it applies to us locally now here this is redfin and i've just done a redfin search for murfreesboro housing market 
because they have some pretty nice little summary here. And it talks about the housing market is somewhat competitive. We were competitive but we're now somewhat competitive. Murphy's were to receive two offers on average and they sell around 33 days. So we've gone up from like five days to a month, okay? And that's still not crazy town to have it. Crazy town was two or three days or to have a house get an offer before we even had got it on the market before it ever showing people were buying houses before we got fully prepped. Now, if we go back and look at our five years and we look at the Murfreesboro market, we see we see we were fairly flat and normal. I would think that this growth rate is about what we should reasonably expect in a healthy economy without some sort of interference. Then we had the COVID crazy and the fear of missing out. Now we've kind of leveled off since 2022. So we're still, according to Redfin, we're, we still haven't lost ground, but perhaps we haven't continued to go up so dramatically. Because if I take that point and I go back cyclically, it's still a slight rise. So we are still making some slight improvements. But what I want to show is in the migration area. That's about this two, two tabs over. So let's slide on down to see it. How hot is the Murfreesboro market? Murfreesboro is somewhat competitive. It's home sell in 40 days. All right, I guess that the selling includes not just the offer, but to get it done. So we have 99.5% of list sales to list price. But what we are seeing here in this is showing that where we were paying above list, because we were above the 100%, we're starting to see some negotiation and some balancing between buyer and sellers. And pretty well much, you don't see any crazy town talk about the bottom falling out of the market. So I think that looks fairly stable. I like graphs. They tell me a lot. I'm a visual spatial learner. Now here, this is what I want to point to. Murfreesboro migration and relocation trends. From April of 24 to June of 24, 25% of Murfreesboro homebuyers searched to move out of Murfreesboro, while 75% look to stay within the area. And I think that's great. I, I like that because Murfreesboro, in my mind, the whole Rutherford County, Murfreesboro area, I think it's a great place to live. I live in Rutherford County. This is this is this is my stomping grounds. I do I do like it here, but I do feel the pressure of increased traffic and the taxes that are going up and the assessments that are going up. So some people, and we don't know their demographics, but at some point in time, I can see myself downsizing from home with property to some tiny little condo and me blowing all the money before I end up in uh, some kind of care of others where I'm just trapped in my little, my little space. So I might want to have some fun before I go. So we don't know where these people, this 25%, where these people are, it's just these are located, identified as people inside here because they're saying they're looking to move out of. But let's look at the migration. The migration shows where the darker the orange is the most movement and where are they coming from? They're coming from, if you'll recognize each of these locations, you'll notice a trend. And again, I'm not trying to be, not trying to be political because I know a lot of people hate politics, but look where the number one places inbound looking is Los Angeles. I can't even say it today because I'm so excited. Los Angeles, California, 2,500 people, net inflow. Chicago, 732. San Francisco, 532. New York City, 394. San Diego, 360. Let me pull it up so that when I do the final cut of this video, we'll get the full table. Knoxville, Tennessee. They're on the list. People are looking to move out of Knoxville to Murfreesboro. Thank you, brothers. You're welcome to come. Phoenix, Arizona, Atlanta, Georgia, Washington, D.C. But what do each of these cities have in common? I'll leave that for you to figure. Now, people who look to move out of Murfreesboro, Tullahoma, beautiful little town, although it's not so little anymore. Destin, Florida. Who doesn't like Destin? Mobile, Alabama, Pensacola, Florida, Panama City, Florida. Huntsville, Alabama, Birmingham, Alabama. So when people move, they typically don't move so far from home. But we are seeing people moving here from a long ways away from home. So that's a little bit of migratory data that we have pulled off of Redfin, and you can find this yourself. And I think it's high taxes, high cost of living. And regardless of your wages, you have to look at what percentage of your life is going to someone else. So maybe you can come to a place with and accept lower wages. 
We also don't have an income tax where each one of those places, I believe you'll find us. So anyway, let's kind of wrap this up and get to our numbers right after this important word from me. Hello, I'm Del Delbridge of Benchmark Realty, Murfreesboro, Tennessee. If you are currently unrepresented and would like to know how to compare up to three properties side by side and room by room, then go over to my new YouTube channel, Call Dell to Sell. That's one L and Dell, no spaces. Watch the demo on Real Scout, and then call me and we'll set up your exclusive ad-free account today. So here we are with our numbers from last week, 719 of 24. We had 22,514 in the availables and coming soon. So our opportunities, it was up over the previous period. Our inventory is increasing. We have 4323 in the under contracts still showing. That went down a little bit. And yet for the fourth week in a row, it remained steady at 20%, the energy ratio between the two. This week, 72624. We had 22. 797 in our opportunities that increased over the previous week. We had 4277 in the under contract still showing and that went the opposite direction that decreased. And what we see is 19 in the ratio between those two numbers. Now that the trend is it reversed last week, but yet it wasn't a significant uh, disparity in the direction of movement to change the energy ratio. So we are in a somewhat competitive market. We're taking a little bit longer to sell a home in Murfreesboro. It's still not terrible. It's still just maybe right at that month period. And we're looking at total close to be about a month and a half. So we're not doing bad. Prices have kind of leveled off. They're not dropping to the basement. Whether or not we get a quarter of a percentage point in mortgage rates is not as significant in my mind. This is my opinion as how those in the market, those who like mortgage news daily are in that mortgage security market, buying and selling and what that industry thinks. And if they believe that the rates are going to fall, they're able to kind of take a little bit of that buffer off of their product because they're looking at the long term in the not so far future getting better for them. If they get a little pessimistic, it could bounce back up. In fact, this week it was, it had gone down. That's kind of come back up just a little bit. But what concerns me is the words that actually come out of Chairman Powell's mouth. He says we need more confidence in getting inflation under control. Is this enough? Because one, one index is not convincing me when I see GDP it's estimate doubling in the second quarter from the first quarter. All right, we're going to let you go. And I got to get this thing chopped up and uploaded. And we appreciate your patience. And I hope this is not always ringing the same bell every week after week.